So this question says, in an isolated system, a red ball moves of mass M moves to the right with the speed V. It strikes a green ball of mass 2M with the initial stationary. After the collision, the red ball remains stationary. How does the green ball move? So if we look at the scenario that's happening, we're going to have our red ball and we're going to have our green ball before the collision. And the red ball has a mass of M and this has a mass of 2M. And it's moving this way at a velocity of V. And let's actually say our initial velocity. Uh, this is not moving. So that's before our collision. And then this is going to be after our collision. So we're going to take this. And now, after our collision, what we have is we have an object. Uh, the red ball stops moving. And now we have some velocity in the green ball at some, in some direction and in some way. So it wants to know how does the green ball move. If we look at that, uh, this is going to be momentum of the red ball plus the momentum of the green ball equals the momentum of the red ball plus the momentum of the green ball. So we're going in to start with this value is zero because there is no velocity. This value is zero because there is no velocity. So mass times initial velocity has to equal uh, two mass times final velocity. So if we look at this, our masses are going to cancel out and we're simply going to solve for V. And to do that, I'm going to divide each side by two and I'm going to get that my final velocity of the green ball is going to equal uh, my initial velocity divided by two. So again, this should be a V. And so the object is going to move in the same direction, but it's going to go twice as fast because it has twice the mass. So this question says, consider a system consisting of two objects initially moving separately. The two objects collide and stick together. If the objects continue moving after crash, uh, what can we say about the kinetic energy and the momentum of the system before and after the crash? The two objects collide and stick together. So what we're going to see with this scenario is, oopsie, if we have uh, one object here, we're going to have a second object here, and they're going to collide and stick together. Oops. So if that is true, oh, let's redo this. So they're going to collide and now stick together as they're moving. And so here's our collision. Now, what we know is that momentum must always be conserved <clears throat> in a collision. But we, what we don't know is we don't know about the kinetic energy and how that works out. Now, with this, uh, if we simply say, you know, let's let's give this a mass of one, we'll give this a mass of two, we'll give this some initial velocity of two, and we'll give this some initial velocity of uh, one. Let's and we'll change this. So I, I know we know the answer. We can get the answer right away if we just understand the motion. But um, let's make this five. So my momentum total is going to equal five plus two, or excuse me, minus two, which is three. So now when we get over here, we still have a mass of one and we still have a mass of two, uh, but the momentum total must equal three. And so this having a mass of three must be moving in this direction at a velocity of one. So if that is true then, um, let's look at their kinetic energy. So this would be one half times one times five squared, which would be uh, 25, which would be 12.5. This one would be one half times two times one squared, <clears throat> which would simply be one. And this would be uh, one half times three times one squared, which would be 1.5. So while initially we have a total kinetic energy of 13.5, we have a total kinetic energy 
of 1.5. So as long as it's not an elastic collision, which when things stick together are never an elastic collision, we're never going to have the kinetic energy be conserved. And the kinetic energy final will always be less than the kinetic energy initial. This question says, in a fusion reaction, two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium uh, combine to create an alpha particle and a neutron. Which of the following describes the result of this fusion reaction? So if we take this initial at the top as my before the collision, and then this is going to be after my collision, we can look at both the momentum and the kinetic energy for both scenarios. So if we look uh, at the information for before, so my momentum uh, total is going to be uh, 2m, uh, let's, yeah, 2m times 2v uh, minus 3m times v. <clears throat> so this would be 4mv minus 3mv, which would simply be mv. So that's my total momentum before. And then after, if we look at that, this should be conserved. So we'll just double check. So we have uh, minus 4mv plus m times 5v, which is going to give me mv. So we can eliminate the change in momentum, like it's asking, is zero. They both have the same momentum before and after they collide. Now, if we look at the energy that we have here, we have to go through this again in terms of one half, uh, 2m times 2v squared plus one half 3m times v squared. So this is just doing this algebraically without any numbers plugging in. So we have one half 2m, and that's 4v squared, plus 1 half 3m v squared. And that's going to equal, I'll cancel out some things here, right? So that's the, the 1 half there. Um, let's actually leave that 1 half in. Uh, we're just going to combine things. So that's 1 half. Uh, and this is 6mv squared plus 3mv squared which is going to be 1 half 9 mv squared. Now, what would it be after? We're going to have 1 half 4 m v squared plus 1 half m 5 v squared. And so if we do that, this 5 v is, is squared. So this is going to be 1 half 4 m v squared plus um, 25 mv squared, which is going to be 1 half 29 mv squared. Now, I just realized I actually made a mistake up here. Uh, when, we, when we got this and combined this, this is not 6, but this is supposed to be 8. Um, so that would be 11. This would be 11. Uh, mv squared. And so the change in kinetic energy, how could we do that? Well, we could do final, right? A change is always final minus initial. So that is um, 29 over 2 mv squared minus 11 over 2 mv squared. And if we do that, <clears throat> we're going to get uh, 18 over 2 mv squared, which is 9 mv squared, which we don't necessarily have to do, right? This is a multiple choice question, and we simply need to identify is the kinetic energy the same or is it different? And so in this case, we can clearly see the kinetic energies are going to be different, uh, even just with this individual one here, right? We know this one these initially only came up to 11 mv squared, and this by itself is going to be 25 mv squared. So we should be able to identify that b is not the correct answer, and that my correct answer is going to be a. <clears throat> the change in momentum is zero, and the kinetic energy here actually increases. 
This question says, a football is kicked perpendicularly at a wall. It follows a horizontal path and bounces back along the same line. Because of the collision, the football's kinetic energy decreases by 5%. The initial momentum has a magnitude of P. What is the magnitude of the change in momentum? So if we think about that scenario, right, if we have our wall here and we have our football, whether it's American or English, hitting and bouncing back, <clears throat> excuse me, and we have our kinetic energy decrease by 5%. They really don't give us much besides that, but it does have some initial momentum of P. Now, what we can look at is we can look at the relationship between kinetic energy and momentum, which kinetic energy is written as P squared over 2M. <clears throat> so we can solve for momentum, which is going to be 2M times the kinetic energy square root. And so what we can look at is if my kinetic energy decreases, my momentum should decrease a little bit as well. There is no other thing, right? There's, it's hitting a wall, and that wall is going to be stationary. So the momentum of this should decrease just a little bit, and that makes sense as, as it bounces back. It's not going to be able to bounce back with quite the same velocity as it had when it was traveling towards the wall. Now, if we look at the answer options, um, we have the options of 1.957p, 1.95p, <clears throat> Um, 0 0.975p and 0 0.025p. So what is the change of momentum? In this case, we're looking for how much does the momentum change by. Now, what we have to understand is that there is an initial momentum this way and initial momentum that way. So the change of momentum is actually pretty significant, right? If we had, if this was p and this is negative p, the change in momentum, which is final, minus initial is a negative 2p, or just by magnitude of 2p. So the ball itself should have a change of momentum of 2p when it's coming back the other way. However, this momentum is going to be a little bit less than this momentum. So we should be able to eliminate the idea that these two answers don't really make sense. If without any loss of energy, the change of momentum is 2p, then with only a 5% loss of energy, we should be at an answer that's pretty close to 2p, which these two answers are. Why people might get confused and do these um, are simply for the fact that they would think that the change in energy is zero, right? Because the, or excuse me, the change in momentum is zero. <clears throat> because they say, well, this has a momentum and this is, should have almost equivalent momentum. But remember, momentum is a vector value. So this must be a negative while this is a positive. This question says, a ball of mass 0.125 kilograms is launched vertically, then falls back to the same place. The velocity time graph for this motion is shown below. Which row correctly shows the impulse of the forces acting on the ball? So first, let's just look at the impulse, the initial impulse given to the ball by the throwing force. So if we think about our scenario, right, we have a ball that is initially at rest and all of a sudden is thrown upwards. So it goes from uh, no momentum to some momentum. And so that is an impulse, right? And that equals a change in momentum. And if my initial momentum is zero and my final momentum is something, the, the change in momentum is simply going to be final minus initial, which if this is zero, the change in momentum and the final momentum are the same. So to find the initial impulse, we simply need to find the initial momentum. So momentum initial... Uh, or final after it's thrown, is simply going to be the mass times the velocity, which is going to be 0. 0.125 times the initial velocity, which is right here at time zero, which is 24.5. When we get that, we get 3.06. And so I can pretty much eliminate answer D. For the second part of the question, I need to find the impulse given to the ball by the force of gravity. So if we think about as the ball is moving upwards and then it comes back down and it reached the same velocity or same speed excuse me as it did before 24.5 this is just now in the negative direction so this part is going to be really dealing with the motion the entire time right the, the impulse given to the ball by the force of gravity so for that impulse 
what we're going to look at. So that impulse, we're going to look at the idea that <clears throat> that's a change in momentum. And so we look at that's uh, mass times velocity final minus mass times velocity initial. And so that's going to be the mass stays the same. So it's going to be my final velocity minus my initial velocity, which is going to be 0.125 times uh, my final velocity is negative 24.5 minus my initial velocity, which is 24.5. And when I plug that in, I should get 6.13 as a negative. And so that's going to prove that A is going to be my best answer. And why does this make sense? Well, my initial velocity is upwards, my final velocity is downwards, and gravity is applying a force the entire time to slow it down on its way up and then speed it up on its way down. And so gravity changes its initial momentum from positive 3.06 to negative 3.06, right? If we draw our momentum vector here, um, we start with an initial momentum, and that'll be my purple one, of 3.06. We end, because it's traveling at the same speed, with a momentum of negative 3.06, so how much did my momentum change due to gravity? Well, that's momentum final minus momentum initial, which is negative 3.06 minus 3.06, which is going to give us the negative 6.13 due to some rounding. This question says a car brakes provide a constant braking force of 2,280 newtons for 7.96 seconds. The car loses 121 kilojoules of kinetic energy and comes to rest. Calculate the mass of the car. So some things that I can look at, right? If we have our car, which is initially moving, and then it, initially, and then it finally comes to rest. So my final velocity is zero. It has some initial velocity. It has a kinetic energy of 121 kilojoules. <clears throat> And it has some force acting backwards, which asks for, acts for a time of 7.96 seconds. So some things that we might initially try to do, right? Um, we know the force <clears throat> and we know the time, and, but we don't know the acceleration. So if we're trying to find the mass of the car, right? Some equations we might think of is F equals MA. Um, the problem is we can't solve for A because we don't know the, the distance that this travels or the velocities, um, initial velocity. So we can't really solve for A in any way. We might think about the equation EK equals one half MV squared. But again, here we don't have the velocity that this object had here. And so that's going to be hard to do. Um, but what we can look at is we have a force which acts for a period of time and so when we have a force and a time that is going to cause a change in momentum or that is an impulse and we also have the equation that can relate energy um, kinetic energy to momentum squared divided by two times m so if we think about this our momentum at this position Let's get our different color green here. Um, our momentum at this final position is zero, and we have some initial momentum, which we're not sure it is. But what we know is that all our momentum, or all our momentum uh, went away, right? So our impulse that took place is going to equal the change in momentum. And in this case, because our final momentum is zero, this is also going to equal my initial momentum. So if I know my momentum and I know my energy, I can then find my mass. So I'm going to rearrange this equation here uh, to find mass. So to do that, I'm going to have 2 times my mass equals EK divided or equals momentum squared. And I'm going to divide each side by 2 times my energy. 
And so that's going to provide mass is equal to momentum squared divided by 2 bk. Now, how, again, can I get my momentum? It's from the concept of impulse. If I know the time of the force that was applied and I know the time that it was applied for, I can find my change of momentum, which we already said, because my final momentum is zero, that is going to equal my initial momentum. So I can then write this as my mass equals uh, force times time, that value squared, divided by two times my energy kinetic. This question says, a space probe far from Earth is traveling 14.8 kilometers per second, has a mass of 1,312 kilograms. The probe fires its rockets to give constant thrust of 156 kilonewtons for 220 seconds. It accelerates in the same direction as its initial velocity, and the time it burns, 150 kilograms of fuel, calculate the final speed of the space probe in kilometers per second. So this question can be pretty challenging for the fact that they give us a lot of different units, um, and they want this in kilometers per second. So our initial assumption might be just to leave this in kilometers per second, but if we have masses in kilograms and forces in newtons and times in seconds, we really need to convert this to meters per second, and then we can convert it back to kilometers per second at the end. So some of the things we're gonna have, our initial velocity is going to be what? One, four, is that one, two, three? So we got one, two, three. 14,800 meters per second. We're gonna have a final velocity, which we don't know. We're gonna have a mass of 1,312 kilograms. We're gonna have a force equal to 156,000 newtons and a time equal to 220 seconds. And then our mass of the fuel, we'll say is 150 kilograms. Okay, so calculate the final speed of the space probe. So here's the idea. And, and I love this as an example of um, what else could be happening, right? If we have our rocket, right, it is has some amount of fuel which is inside of it. And basically from it moving forward, we're going to have this same rocket here, but now we've lost some of our fuel, right? We've burned some of our fuel. So, and the fuel lost is the mass of the fuel. That's 150 kilograms, right? It, and this time it burns 150 kilo, kilograms mm -hmm. of fuel. So. My initial mass here is the 1312 kilograms. My mass final, so we'll mark this as mass initial. My final mass is going to be that minus 150. So that's going to be 162, 1162 kilograms. Now, from it burning fuel, it has become lighter. So even if I have a constant thrust, Right, because we have the equation F equals MA, right? My acceleration is going to be force over mass. The acceleration of the rocket is actually not going to be constant here because the force stays constant, but the mass is constantly decreasing as I burn fuel. So my acceleration is going to actually increase. Now, what I can do though is use the concept of impulse and say, well, we know that the force acting for a period of time is going to equal a change in momentum. So this is going to be my initial momentum. This is going to be my final momentum. And force times time then would equal momentum final minus momentum initial, which that is going to equal mass times my final velocity minus mass times my initial velocity. So if we look here, I know the force, I know the time, I know my final mass, I know my initial mass, and I know my initial velocity, and so I can find my final velocity. So this is actually, I would designate final mass and initial mass uh, because these two masses are not the same thing now based on it burning the fuel. 
So what I can do then, let's see, <clears throat> is I can solve for that final velocity. So I have force times time equals mass final uh, velocity final minus mass initial velocity initial. I'm going to uh, add this over onto both sides. So I'm going to get mass final velocity final equals force times time plus mass initial velocity initial. And then I would simply divide by both, uh, both sides by my final mass. So I'm going to get my final velocity is going to equal my force times time plus my initial mass times my initial velocity divided by my final mass. And that's going to be uh, give me the ability then to figure out what's that final velocity that that rocket's going to achieve. This question says a ball collides with a stationary toy train carriage. As seen here, the velocity of the ball decreases from 1.2 meters per second to the right to 0.1 meters per second to the right. The carriage then collides with the stationary toy locomotive. The carriage and locomotive join together. Calculate the speed in meters per second of the locomotive and train carriage immediately after the second collision. So in this case, we're going to have two collisions. We're going to have the collision where the ball strikes the carriage and bounces apart. And then we're going to have the collision where the carriage strikes the locomotive and bounces together. So we're going to classify this as collision one. For collision one, we have the momentum of the ball uh, plus the momentum of the carriage equals momentum of the ball plus momentum of the carriage. In this case, the carriage is initially at rest, so its initial momentum is zero. So we're going to get mass times initial velocity of the ball equals whoopsie, <clears throat> equals uh, mass of the ball times its final velocity plus mass of the carriage times its final velocity. And so if we want to know the, mo the velocity of this, we're going to then have to have this colliding with that. So we're going to first find the velocity of the carriage, the final velocity of the carriage. So velocity of the carriage is going to be mass of the ball, initial velocity of the ball, <clears throat> minus mass of the ball, final velocity of the ball, divided by the mass of the carriage. That's going to give me how fast is this carriage going to run into this uh, locomotive, right? <clears throat> now, be careful here because we need to convert these masses to kilograms. And I think that's really the only other thing that would be catchy. Uh, this is a positive 1.2 meters per second. This is a positive 0.1 meters per second because they're still both moving to the right. Then we're going to do collision two. So in collision two, we're going to have the momentum of the carriage plus the momentum of the locomotive equals the momentum of the carriage plus the momentum of the locomotive. And what we're trying to find is what is the speed of the locomotive? Um, what we know is we know the initial velocity of the locomotive is zero. So our initial momentum will be zero. So what we're going to have is we're going to have momentum uh, or mass of the carriage times initial velocity of the carriage, which that is this, right? So this here is now my initial velocity in collision two. Uh, equals mass of the carriage, final velocity, plus mass of the locomotive, final velocity. These two are the same because they are combining together. And so we're going to then rewrite this as mass of the carriage plus mass of the locomotive times my final velocity. And then here I could solve for my final velocity by saying the velocity equals the mass of the carriage, initial velocity of the carriage, divided by the mass of the carriage plus the mass of the locomotive. From that, I'll be able to find what is the velocity that the locomotive and the carriage are going to move away after the collision. Again, pay attention. Our masses should be in kilograms with our velocities in meters per second. This question says the graph below shows the variation of time the magnitude of the net force acting on the body moving along a straight line. 
what does the shaded area represent? So if we look at this, the shaded area, right? If we just think about like this box right here and trying to find that shaded area, um, the area of that would be the uh, this side, which would be the value of the force at that point, and then this side, which would be the value of the time. So that would simply be the force times the time, which is going to tell me that the area would be equal to my impulse. <clears throat> which would also be equal to the, the change in momentum that took place. So this is going to be useful because there are times where we maybe don't have a constant force, but if I have uh, the ability to find the area of this graph, I can find the impulse or the change in momentum. This question says, a particle is accelerated under the influence of a net force. The graph shows the variation of the force with time. So as we can see, this is not a constant force. The net force is actually drastically increasing as time goes along. And it asks, what is the shaded area equal to? So if we understand that that shaded area is, you know, if we try to find just this area right here, um, this side would be the force at that point. The length here would be the time that that force was acting on. And so we can see that the area is going to equal my impulse. <clears throat> and that is force times time. That's also going to call, uh, let me know how much my momentum is going to change. So it doesn't necessarily tell me how much my momentum is, but how much my momentum changes. So if it does start, maybe at a momentum of zero, whatever the change is, is going to be the final momentum as well. This question says, under the circumstances, is the momentum of the system conserved? And really, it's, it's the main idea, um, and this goes back to Newton's third law, or no, excuse me, Newton's first law, right? Um, an object in motion stays in motion until acted upon by an outside force. Uh, and you can read that as the momentum of an object stays constant unless acted upon by an outside force. So what circumstance is the momentum of a system conserved? As long as there is no outside force acting on the object, the momentum will stay the same. This question says, a collision occurs in a closed system. How often are linear momentum, kinetic energy, and total energy conserved? So a big key here is it talks about a closed system, which means there's no outside forces. <clears throat> and so for that, we can say that we know that the uh, momentum should be conserved. So we're good with this, and this one automatically goes away from our first one. The second instance is looking at kinetic energy. Right? Kinetic energy is only going to be conserved in a perfectly elastic collision and not an inelastic or explosion. And so we can say that sometimes the kinetic energy should be conserved as well. So we should be able to now eliminate answer A. And then lastly is my total energy. And uh, total energy, just like we talked about, if there's no outside forces, there's no outside work. So the total energy should then be conserved, not just sometimes. So our best answer in this scenario is going to be B. It's always linear momentum, sometimes kinetic, but always total. And that's why when we talk about collisions, linear momentum is going to be the easiest way to attack the problem because we always have momentum being conserved. This question says, an explosion in an initially stationary spaceship in deep, empty space causes it to split in two pieces. One piece has three times the mass of the other. What is the ratio of the magnitudes of momentum and kinetic energy of the light piece to the heavy piece. Assume a negligible quantity of energy is conserved <clears throat> to internal or thermal energy. So if we have our spaceship and then that spaceship breaks apart and one piece has three times the mass, right? So we have our small piece, and then we have our large piece and this is three times the mass and this is just mass. What's gonna happen, whoopsie, is one object is going to move to the right with some velocity, and then one object is going to move to the left with some velocity. Now, because it is an explosion, the total momentum must stay the same. So if the, an explosion in an initially stationary spaceship 
So that means my initial momentum must be zero. So that means momentum of little m plus the momentum of oops, uh, 3m must equal zero as well. So what can that tell me? Well, the first part is we're trying to do the ratio of momentum. And if these two added together equal zero, uh, this is going to be a negative momentum because we have a negative velocity. This is going to be a positive momentum because we have a positive velocity. And if we add a negative plus a positive, we get a zero. Those two values must be the same. So the only answer that really makes sense here would be B and C in terms of their momentums. Now, what about the ratio of their kinetic energies? Uh, <clears throat> what we can look at is because this is mass times velocity plus mass times velocity equals zero, this must be, this must be uh, mass times negative 3V. Uh, let's write that a little differently um, for my object on the left. This is going to be mass times negative 3V. There we go. Uh, plus three mass times V <clears throat> equals zero. So the velocity of the smaller object must be three times the velocity of the larger object. So if we're doing the ratio of the kinetic energy of the light piece to the heavy piece, right? So we have the kinetic energy of M divided by the kinetic energy of three M. That's going to be one half M three V squared divided by one half 3m v squared. My one halves are going to go away, my m's go away, my v's go away, and what I'm left with is uh, 9 over 3, or 3 to 1. So <clears throat> that gets me here. And so that's going to give me my best answer in this scenario would be B. This question says a soccer ball of mass of 600 grams is sliding to the right on a wet pitch at a velocity of two meters per second until it is kicked to the left. A force of 20 newtons is applied to the kick for a duration of 150 milliseconds. What is the new velocity of the ball? Give your answer in meters per second to one sig fig with a sign of plus or minus and without units. So here's our pitch. <clears throat> we have our soccer ball which is sliding to the right which has a mass equal to 0.6 kilograms it's moving this way at a velocity of two there is then a force which is acting to the left and that force is going to be 20 newtons and the time would be 0.15 seconds so it asks, what is the new velocity of the ball? So what I can see is I have a force acting for a period of time. Whenever we have a force acting for a period of time, that is going to be an impulse, which will cause a change in momentum. So force times time is going to equal change of momentum, which is equal to momentum final minus momentum initial. If I have that then, that's going to equal mass times velocity final minus mass times velocity initial force times time. I am trying to solve for what is that final velocity? So to do that, we're going to do force times time plus mass times initial velocity equals mass times final velocity. And then I'm going to simply divide each side by my mass. So I get that my velocity equals the force times the time plus the initial momentum divided by my mass. Now, what I should be able to do is if this comes out to be a positive value, that means that the ball is sliding to the right. Still, if it comes out to be a negative value, that means that the ball is now moving to the left. And so that's a way to understand what the direction is. And my value should come out in meters per second because we converted all our other values to SI units. This question says a force is applied to an object. The force varies with time according to the following curve. What is the impulse delivered by the force? So if we can look at this, 
Uh, obviously, we have a curve here, but we can try to simplify this by really estimating our impulse by finding the area of triangle one and the area of triangle two. Because what we know is that the area of this question is simply going to be force times time if it were a nice straight graph, which is going to be my impulse, which is also my change in momentum. So if I want to find that area of triangle one, that's going to be one half of my base, which is going to be uh, 90, we're going to change this to seconds. So that is going to be <clears throat> 0 0.090 seconds times my force, which, you know, we might say that's around 18, 19, or 20. I think either one of those would, would be good, but um, let's just say it hits the top there, which would be 20. And then area two is essentially going to be the same thing. And so I can really just get rid of this one half and understand that the total area is going to be those two combined. All right, so looking at this question, it says consider the situation shown below. We have a red ball, two kilograms, traveling to the right at 18 meters per second. We have a green ball traveling to the left at 11 meters per second. The velocity of the heavier ball after the collision, which is the green, is 3.5 meters per second to the right. Is the last uh, collision elastic or inelastic? So remember, for an elastic collision, we have both the conservation of momentum and we have the conservation of kinetic energy. That can be found by using the one half mass times velocity squared plus one half mass times velocity squared, and these are my initials. And to see if that equals one half mass times velocity squared plus one half mass times velocity squared of my final scenario. So if I look at all of this, I know both of the masses, I know both initial velocities, and I know the green's final velocity. So to see if these two sides equal, because we know this always is going to be equal, uh, we need to find the final velocity of the red after the collision. So find VR after the collision, and we're going to set that. We're going to do that by using the conservation of momentum. So the total momentum before equals the total momentum final. And I have mass times initial velocity plus mass times initial velocity of the red and green equals mass times final velocity of the red plus mass times final velocity of the green. I'm trying to solve for this here, the final velocity of the red. So I'm going to subtract over the green's final momentum, which I get red's initial momentum plus green's initial momentum minus green's final momentum. And I'm going to divide by then the mass of the red. And that's going to provide this equation here. Now, as you're putting these numbers in, just make sure you're paying attention. 18 is going to be a positive value. 11 is going to be a negative value, right? My initial momentum of the green should be to the, to the left, which is negative. So make sure you're applying that here or here as we're plugging that in. Next, then we're going to see uh, if once we have this, we can plug that into here and see does this entire left side equal this entire right side. If it does, then that's going to prove that this is an elastic collision. If they don't, then it would be an inelastic collision um, because the kinetic energy is not conserved. This question says a tennis ball is lightly thrown vertically upwards to be struck by the racket at the peak of its trajectory of the ball. A 350 gram tennis racket hits the ball with a velocity of 30 meters per second. Both racket and ball move with a horizontal velocity of 25 meters per second immediately after the collision. What is the mass of the ball in grams? So we're going to have our ball, which is initially thrown upwards. So if this is our ball, we're going to throw it up to here, moving here. And that's at the peak. So really the momentum initial is going to be zero at this point. Then we're going to have our racket, <clears throat> which is going to hit the tennis ball and <clears throat> provide a force to it. So what it's asking then is what is the mass of the ball in grams, whereas we know the mass of the racket is 350 or 0.35 kilograms. 
the racket itself had initial velocity of 30. And then they move off together at 25 meters per second. So uh, what is the mass of the ball? So we're going to have the mass. Um, let's actually say this. We're going to have the uh, momentum of the racket plus the momentum of the ball equals the momentum of the racket plus the momentum of the ball. And because the ball is at its maximum height, the initial momentum of the ball is going to be zero. So we'll have the mass of the racket times the initial velocity of the racket. It's going to equal uh, mass of the racket, final velocity, plus mass of the ball, final velocity. Now, you could say racket and ball, but <clears throat> both racket and ball move with a horizontal velocity of 25 meters per second. So what we know is the final velocity of the racket equals the final velocity of the ball. So we can then factor that out and say the mass of the racket, initial velocity of the racket, equals velocity times mass of the racket plus mass of the ball. And this is what we're looking for right here. Uh, what is the mass of the ball? So I'm going to try to isolate that by itself. We're going to divide each side by V. I'm struggling with my colors here. <clears throat> We're going to divide each side by V, the final velocity of both the ball and the racket, and we'll get the mass of the ball equals the mass of the racket, initial velocity of the racket, divided by V <clears throat> minus the mass of the racket. And that's how I'm going to set that up to be able to solve for the mass of the ball. This question says, the model, a Model A rocket with a mass of 50 grams is free to travel along a horizontal track. It begins from rest. After two seconds, the rocket has lost 10% of its mass by expelling air and an average velocity of 30 to 53 meters per second. What is the velocity of the rocket at that moment? Give your answer meters per second to two sig figs without a unit. So if we have our air track here and we have our rocket, <clears throat> which is traveling in this direction, and it has a mass equal to 50 grams or <clears throat> 0 0.050 kilograms. Its initial velocity zero. And after two seconds, so that's time equals two. Um, its mass is 10% less. So mass equals <clears throat> mass initial times 0 0.9, so it's 10% less. And it's traveling a velocity, it's mass by expelling air at an average velocity of 53 uh, meters per second. So the air is moving backwards in this direction at a velocity equal to 53 meters per second. What is the velocity of the rocket at that moment? Give your answers to two sig figs. So here's how I'm going to interpret this. I think the best way would be think of this as some explosion um, with the idea that the rocket initially at rest has um, the two substances, the, the mass, the rocket, as well as the air inside of it. And they both start with some initial velocity of zero. We're trying to figure out how fast the rocket is traveling to the right, so the velocity of the rocket. We know that the velocity of the air is traveling to the left. And so let's see if we can figure out um, how that all goes together. So we're going to say that the momentum initial has to equal the momentum 
final. And again, we're saying our initial momentum is zero. So we can just set our initial momentum to zero because our initial velocity is zero. So what we're going to have then on the other side is we're going to have the momentum of the air and the momentum of the rocket. And so if we think about that, those two then have to be equal to each other, but in opposite directions. And that makes sense because the air is going to be traveling to the left, which is a negative. The rocket's going to be traveling to the right, which is going to be a positive. So we have the mass of the air plus the final velocity of the air equals the mass of the rocket plus the final velocity of the rocket. So what can we say? The mass total starts at 0 0.05 kilograms. The mass of the air <clears throat> is going to equal 0 0.1 times 0 0.05 kilograms, which is going to be 0 0.005 kilograms, which is going to leave the mass of a rocket as whatever is left, which is going to be 0 0.045 kilograms. So we can plug those two values in for my mass and my velocity, or my masses, excuse me, we know the final velocity of the air is 53 meters per second, and we can solve for the velocity of the rocket. I'm not sure why this looks like a plus sign, so we'll, we'll get rid of that. We'll rewrite this as simply the velocity of the rocket, which is going to leave the velocity of the rocket is simply going to be the mass of the air times the velocity of the air divided by the mass of the rocket. This question says, a net horizontal force acts upon a stationary ball for 25 milliseconds when it is kicked by a soccer player. If the magnitude of the momentum of the ball after being kicked is 26, uh, excuse me, 2.6 kilograms meters per second, what is the size of the force in the ball? Give your answers to the correct nearest Newton without a unit. So we're going to use the equation force times time equals a change in momentum. If we think about what this problem says, it says a net horizontal force acts upon a stationary ball. So what that tells me is that tells me that my initial momentum is going to equal zero. Then the magnitude of the momentum of the ball after being kicked is 2.6 kilograms meters per second. So momentum final is 2.6. So if we think about that, the change of momentum is simply momentum final minus momentum initial, which is going to be 2.6 because this is zero and anything minus zero is just itself. So let's then find the size of the force. To do that, I'm going to divide each side by my time. And I'm going to get that the force equals, in this case, it's going to be just my final momentum divided by my time. <clears throat> From that, I should be able to find my force. This question says, a rocket engine uses 275 kilograms, sec kilograms per second of fuel and expels gas particles on an average speed of 1,215 meters per second. What is the thrust produced by the engine? Assume the engine is 100% efficient. Give your answer in kilonewtons without units and the appropriate number of sig figs. So <clears throat> I'm going to take a look at this equation of force times time equals a change in momentum. I'm going to do that because it's asking us to find the force and when we're dealing with momentum usually this is the equation we're going to deal with force it gives us a time which is 275 kilograms per second so while it doesn't necessarily say time we do have a time built into this so let's rewrite this as um, a change in momentum 
which can be a change in mass times velocity. So if we think about in this scenario, a rocket engine uses this and expels the gas particles at an average speed of this. So here's what I read. The mass changes and the velocity is constant. And that can still mean a change in momentum because momentum is mass times velocity. And so if the mass changes, but the velocity is constant, I'm going to either lose or gain momentum depending upon what's happening to the mass itself. So let's rewrite this then in terms of force. Force is going to equal a change in mass times velocity divided by my change in time. This is given to us right here. A change in mass divided by time. And we're given an average velocity here. And so I can use that and kind of write it like this in terms of a change in mass over a change in time multiplied by a velocity. And that is going to get me my force that is acting. This question says a car is moving at a constant speed of 25 meters per second, has a mass of 730 kilograms, and collides with another stationary car of mass of 1800 kilograms. If the two cars stick together, what is their final velocity immediately after the collision? <clears throat> so we're going to have car one, which is moving. We have car two, which is stationary. And then they're going to collide, and we're going to have both cars moving together. And what makes sense is that they would both be moving to the right. So we're going to have this object here. Because it is stationary, it's going to have zero momentum. So we'll call this um, car little b and this car big b in terms of their mass. So the momentum of little b is going to equal the momentum of little b plus the momentum of big b. And I'm going to write that as mass of little b times my initial velocity of little b. It's going to equal mass of little b plus mass of big b times the velocity. If they are sticking together, they're going to be moving together. So they both have the same velocity. So I'm going to factor that out. And if I'm looking for their final velocity, it's going to be the mass of little b times the initial velocity divided by the mass of little b plus the mass of big b. This question says, a baseball is traveling horizontally when it strikes a wall with the speed of u and rebounds back the way it came with the same speed. If the baseball has a mass of m, what is the magnitude of change in momentum? So a change in momentum. Remember, that is momentum final minus momentum initial. So if we have our baseball, which is going to travel this way at a speed of u, it's then going to rebound and travel this way at the same speed. <clears throat> and this is getting into the idea that momentum is a vector. So this is going to be a positive momentum whereas this scenario is going to be a negative momentum or vice versa it doesn't matter negative and positive we simply have to make sure that we identify one as positive and one as negative so in doing so that's going to be my final would be negative mass times velocity and we'll just use u <coughs> minus mass times u. So my change is going to be uh, negative 2 mu. Now because this question simply asks for the magnitude, I can drop the negative and my answer would simply be 2 mu. This question says, which of the following is true of an inelastic collision? And we're going to define an inelastic or elastic collision basically by the idea of their momentum and their kinetic energy.
for a inelastic collision, momentum needs to be conserved. And kinetic energy does not need to be conserved. And this is really the difference <clears throat> between an elastic and an inelastic. And an inelastic, momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is not. And an elastic, both of them would be conserved. But which of the following is true for an inelastic collision? We basically want to find that the momentum should be conserved, but the kinetic energy is not.